Hello and welcome to Somerville Media Center Live. I'm Joe Lynch. Today is June 25th. This is the state delegation update with State Representative Christine Barber and State Representative Denise Provo. How is everyone this afternoon? Rep Provo. Fine, thank you, sir, and yourself. Terrific. Rep Barber? Doing, doing okay. Glad to be here. Thank you, Joe. Good, good to hear it. Uh, we are in full swing of summertime. Um, the state delegation is uh, working diligently, trying to figure out, A, where's the money gonna come from for all of this, and B, how are we gonna spend it and how we're gonna track it? But let's go over to um, State Rep Provo first. Uh, Denise, you wanna talk a little bit about daycare because that is a critical piece of people going back to work, finding uh, daycare for their young ones. It is also something that will be critical when the school systems itself thinks about opening in September. Uh, yes, I get a lot of constituent inquiries about daycare because the new standards that the Department of Early Education and Care has put out are much more restrictive um, in terms of of how centers are allowed to operate with fewer children, which means that not every family that's enrolled in the center now will be accommodated, assuming the centers reopen. The costs are gonna be higher for the centers in terms of complying with, uh, with the hygiene and sanitation. So the, the economics of running daycare has changed and I think not every center is going to reopen. Right now centers are submitting safety plans they're called you know to detail how they plan to reopen you know how they how they're going to use their space and what their procedures are going to be and I think there's going to be a, a a crunch that there will not be enough slots for all the people who want and need them in order to be able to work. So once again, we're looking at a, a case of supply and demand. There will be a dwindling supply of the number of daycare centers because mm -hmm. some may not survive COVID and the demand will be so high and the protocols that these daycares will have to put in place will effectually drive their costs up. And that cost has to be passed back to the working parents or caregivers of those children, some of whom have lost their jobs. Yep. Not a good equation. Not good. Um, Rep Barber, I know you've been talking about the early education aspect up on Beacon Hill. How does this dovetail into the daycare problem? They're really related and one of the same. I think I agree with all that Rep Provo said. And the problem really is we didn't have a system before. It's always been a piecemeal system of, um, we have some very low subsidies for very low income families um, for, for early education. A lot of families, including low income families, don't have any help and they are, um, paying for early education and childcare out of their own pocket, as we know. Um, and then I've been working, I'm on the Early Ed Workforce Council, I've been on for a number of years, and the workforce, um, the, the teachers who are working with young children are, are um, amazing and paid very low wages. And it's almost all women, many women of color who are doing these jobs. Um, and we are, you know, they are incredibly necessary for us to go back to work, to have um, people willing to do these jobs. And they're also scared. Um, they're worried about going back. They're worried about the transmission of disease. Um, and, you know, the Department of Early Ed put out fairly stringent rules that are really hard for centers to meet. Um, but even some some teachers are still are still nervous about going back. So it's going to take a lot more money. Um, it's going to take more personnel and really rethinking of the whole system. And 
Uh, Congresswoman Clark just filed a bill that's great at the federal level to, to inject some, some money into this program. Um, we're going to need a wholesale effort like that. So reop it is one of the huge challenges of reopening. Dovetailing right into uh, taking care of kids, whether it's through you know early education or daycare centers is the uh, something you've been working on is the summer meal sites for kids. You want to stay with that for a minute, Rep. Barber? Sure. So uh, something I wanted to mention, um, this was a successful effort about a week or two ago. Um, the USDA oversees the rules for the summer meal programs. So for usually kids who qualify for free and reduced lunch um, can get access to food, uh, nutritious lunches and food all summer. Um, since the COVID crisis, that's been opened up. So any kid, it doesn't matter, um, you know, if you qualify for free and reduced lunch, no questions asked. Every kid in the Commonwealth can get breakfast and lunch um, at certain meal sites. That's a USDA um, rule and program. And, and as of a few weeks ago, we didn't know if that was going to extend th through the summer. And a lot of our meal sites were at risk, um, especially I had a number of sites in my district in Medford that were at risk of closing. Um, and so I led an effort and Rep Provost was a signer and a big supporter of um, reaching out to the USDA and really pushing them to waive that rule and let the meal sites stay open. So happy to say we got the notice a couple days ago that um, there will be summer meals throughout the whole summer. Um, for kids at all of the sites that have been running. So it's a, it's a, you know, a good to have small wins in these challenging times. And it's really been an important way for kids to, to have some connection, of course, to get nutritious food. Small, small wins or wins. Rep Provo. Oh, yeah, I was just going to say that Somerville has got a very well organized food security group that's been meeting every week since the, sh the shutdown and had made started making school meals available um, from the, the week after the Somerville schools closed. That's how quickly they had it organized. And um, you know, they're grab and go, as they call them meals, so that people can distance. But they, you know, they've done a great job of, you know, providing diapers for families that are living on the margins and, and you know, um, providing meals or, and food for people who are quarantined. It's a, it's a tremendous collaborative effort and we have a lot to be proud of. Yeah. Ray, rays of sunshine during the storm that we call 2020. Think, uh, speaking of the margins, let's talk about, um, I know both of you, your favorite subject in the world these days, the budget, the state budget. How are we gonna tackle loss of revenue, increased costs due to COVID, um, while trying to maintain the existing programs that we have? I'm gonna ask Rep Provo if she wants to take it away because there is an announcement that you gave to me before the show about a billion dollars in COVID related uh, funding. Well, that's, that's separate money. This was a bill that Rep Harbor and I voted on yesterday in a formal session of the House, over a billion dollars of COVID related expenditures with the expectation of reimbursement from the federal government. Um, but I think when you spoke of the budget, you were talking about the state's annual budget. Yes. And the answer to how we're going to approach that is in the short run, incrementally. Uh, the governor has filed a 112 budget, basically a, a budget to take us through the next month. And um, because the, the fiscal year is, is going to end at the end of June. Um, which is pretty close to level funding from last year. Um, just a few little tweaks. And we're told that there might be another uh, 112 budget coming up after that one to give us time to get a better take on what our revenue picture looks like 
whether the HEROES Act, which has been passed by Congress and is stalled in the Senate, is going to go through because that could potentially give a lot of relief to um, state and municipal government, which was not in the CARES Act to any significant extent. But, so on the budget side, um, yeah. I understand what they're doing and I think a lot of the municipalities are also looking towards a 112 budget because some of their funding flows from the state budget. Mm -hmm. So I, I want to try to be careful on, on weaving these two pieces of what we're living with. There are actually three pieces that we're living with. We're living with a global pandemic. We are living with grassroots movements to defund the police. And mm -hmm. I assume that Governor Baker is going to get the same pressure that municipalities are getting is to defund certain portions of the state police or certain portions of what's provided to police. I know um, Mayor Walsh, Mayor Curtitoni, a lot of the mayors are dealing with this right now. So I guess I wanna be careful and not to conflate a lot of these, although they are connected. So on the budget side from the state, we're looking for level funding, a 112 budget, mm -hmm. but there's a lot of uncertainty about the revenue side of this thing. So do, are you allowed, uh, just a technical question, on, under the state guidelines or rules, are you allowed to carry that 112th budget for many months? I don't know that it's addressed specifically in the general laws. Uh, what is addressed specifically in the general laws is that our budgets have to be balanced. Expenditures and, um, Revenue and expenditures have to be in balance. And if revenues um, are coming in short, then the governor is required to make media cuts called 9C cuts. So 9C nine, nine cuts, I got the gist of that, but I guess I'm looking at it from the 112 standpoint. If all of a sudden we realize that we can't get a balanced budget at the end of July, can you then call for another extension of the 112 budget? And then someplace in August, you realize the revenues have plummeted. Can he then take a scalpel to the budget and start cutting at that point? I, I could tell you my read of the statutes is that if revenues are insufficient to pay appropriations, then the governor has a duty to make cuts. It's, um, it's that simple. Um, as to exactly the timing, I think there's some discretion there. Um, but you know, the, the one thing that's strong about the Massachusetts economy right now is that we have a sizable rainy day fund. You know, we have put, put money aside. Uh, and I imagine that a certain amount of that will be drawn on to balance the budget in the absence of new revenues. Um, but, you know, being careful not to jeopardize our, our credit rating. Do you have... I I didn't prep for our budget talk well enough because I don't know how much money is in the Massachusetts or any day fund. How much is in there? Three and a half billion, right? 3.5 billion? It's about that, yeah. Three and a half billion. Um, if things don't turn around quickly on terms of the revenues coming in, you could be dipping into that probably in the late summer, early fall. Yeah. Just... My banker brain is trying to comprehend, you know, if, if things go south real quick in the fall, what do we do? Well, Joe, there are other options too. We can't, um, I think the idea that we can just level fund everything is not tenable. I mean, the forecasts coming in are at least an $8 billion, or between a six and $8 billion hole in the budget. And I think the numbers I saw, that's about 17%. That is a significant hole, um, more so than the 2008 
uh, recession and um, we are going to have to make tough decisions. And I, I don't think we know, you know, where those cuts will be. Um, and if, you know, we're trying to hold some things um, as whole as we possibly can. Um, but something that we've been talking about um, among the progressive legislators is, is progressive revenue. Um, that while um, taxes may not always be popular, there are some entities, especially corporations, that are making money right now during a global pandemic. So I just filed a bill um, to close corporate tax loopholes and it would it's, uh, go after some of the, the corporations that are hiding profits in offshore accounts. So they basically can hide their, their profits in, in offshore low tax areas and not pay taxes on those um, here. It's actually something that was carved out in, in the, the fairly recent federal tax um, reform, that Trump, Trump's tax reform, but this was actually a good piece of it that carved out this offshore um, profit. It's actually, the acronym is GILTI, um, Global Intangible Low tax. tax Income, I believe is what that stands for. Um, and by increasing the amount Massachusetts taxes this, we could raise, the estimates are about a half a billion dollars. So that could go a long way to, you know, funding education and funding healthcare and all of the things that we need to be funding right now. The optimist in me says, I hope it works. The pessimist says the big offshore, the companies that are hiding cash offshore have a lot of lawyers. So how, how realistic is it that we would get that type of revenue in time by the end of the year? Um, there's always, yes, corporations are always good at stacking the deck against us. So I won't say it's not an uphill battle, but it is something that other states have done. Of course, I'm not remembering off the top of my head what states, but there are a number. So the feds did this, um, as I said, in Trump's tax, um, tax bill, which you know was a giveaway to lots of groups, but this was one good piece of it. Um, and some states have followed suit. So we could we could do that in Massachusetts if we chose to. It's a, a matter of choices. Are we going to tax corporations that are making money now? Um, or are we going to cut teachers and cut you know education? I think those are choices that we may need to make. Well, this is uh, one not wealthy person's um, opinion. I've always liked the idea of taxing the rich more. Right. <laughs> I've always liked it. You don't get any opposition from me. Let's weave that piece of it into, um, I happen to watch some of the budget hearing last night here in Somerville. And there were many, many speakers from the public calling for the, um, I'm, I'm not gonna use the word because I think it, 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 it is misunderstood by a lot of people when we say defunding the police. Um, I'm not going to use the word because I, I I think it sends the wrong message. I think what this group is looking for to do with this current budget in the city of Somerville is a commitment from the councilors and the mayor of a reallocation of a lot of the money that the police get today for such things as military grade weapons, for such things as um, uniforms that make them look like stormtroopers out of a Star Wars movie. Um, there are many, many items that the police departments, not just Somerville, but police departments are purchasing. Um, and this group is saying, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute. There are 4,000 of us in the city of Somerville who are saying that's not the way to spend the tax, tax dollars. Let's reallocate that. Let's figure out what the police job actually is and reallocate some of that funding. Within the state budget, are there calls for defunding of the state police budget? I've had a couple of constituent emails um, that mention such a thing, but I would point out that it's not something that's being called for by members of the Black and Latino Legislative Caucus. Our colleagues in the legislature are not asking for 
a defunding at this point okay. of the state police. So locally here, um, listening in last night, um, there are demands calling for a 60% reduction. So my question is, is that realistic for any local police force just to go in, take the scalpel, cut 60% of their budget, and then expect them to continue on operating for the public health, public safety? I'd be surprised if there are a lot of police departments that have that much fat, shall we say, in their public safety budgets. Um, Somerville's is fairly lean, I think, for a city of this size. Um, you know, it's one of those things um, where you would have to look at the line items within the line items and not only figure out what's cuttable, but where, where you would put it, where you would put it that performs, I, I guess the idea is to perform public safety functions better and less um, offensively to the community. But I'm not, it's not clear to me um, right now what it is about police conduct in Somerville that people are upset with or offended by. I think that that it would be helpful to try to understand what the problems are. And, and then if you're going to make cuts, use that as your roadmap. Rep Barber, over in Medford, do we have a similar call for defunding of the police department in Medford? There is, there is. Uh, we've had, a, there was a very, also a very well attended uh, hearing uh, last night or Monday night in Medford. So the same kind of activity there. And, and I would go back to, to something that Rep Provo said at the beginning, at, earlier in this discussion, is that at the state level, what we are, are doing is listening to the Black and Latino Caucus. They have led, uh, put out a 10 point plan. And there's a lot of um, good piece, really good pieces on there, like uh, a bill filed by Liz Miranda to um, stop uh, excessive use of force and tear gas and militarization, and it's a very well uh, researched bill. So we're supporting their asks, and I think similarly at the city level, it's listening to um, black and brown people and people who have been targeted by police and say, you know, what, what kind of reforms are you looking for? What are your experiences and what should we be doing here? How can we do this differently? And um, so in, in Medford, there's a group called Mobilize Medford that has um, just started organizing and they've been incredible in how many people they can bring together and how many conversations they've been having and letters of um, suggestions they're putting out to the city. Um, I know Somerville has the Just Us group um, also organizing, um, a group led by people of color. So uh, I'm you know, working with those groups and, and trying to listen and, and hear what makes the most sense from, from their experience. Well, one of the pieces that I did catch last night came from somebody who is known to all three of us, uh, a man of color, person of color, Ben Echevarria, when his remarks centered on almost exactly what I think my sentiments are. White people, please stop trying to change the game. Ask us how we want that game changed. So um, with no disrespect to a lot of the allies that ha and friends that are trying to move this along, um, I think it's time we, and this is me, no disrespect reps, this is me, we as white people have to shut up and sit down and listen to what black and brown people are saying. It's all good to give support, but five hours, this is mine, five hours of a lot of white people saying, this is what we want you to do, didn't cut it with me last night. I'm getting a signal here that we have some time left. Medicaid, that's my, my thought, Medicaid bill, <laughs> Do you want to talk about that? 
Sure, it's a big transition here, but um, it is related to COVID and it an, also is an equity piece. Um, so as some people know, um, um, if for people who use Medicaid, especially for end of life care, so it could be nursing home care, but it could also be community home care at, at your end of life. Um, when, when a family member passes away, uh, Medicaid goes after the estate of that family member. And sometimes that can mean taking the house um, and pretty um, a draconian ways of, of recovering money for that care. It's been especially egregious during COVID, um, partly due to many unfortunate deaths that have happened. And also because we're not um, out, we can't interact in the courts in the same way, there's been some real, um, there's been some terrible stories about a state recovery. So I just filed a bill with Senator Comerford from Northampton to um, stop some of the more egregious uh, ways of taking people's estates. Um, and it's something that we're working closely with the administration on. So that's my uh, quick somebody, plug on that. Yeah. Thanks, Christine. As somebody who faced that many years ago with my own parents, plow on, because it's just patently not fair for somebody to lose the most valuable asset they have because of a health condition or long-term nursing. And Massachusetts is actually worse at this than most other states. While we're good on healthcare and a lot of things, this we are not good at. So it's a place we have a lot of room to grow. Rep Provo, parting thoughts before we take our leave for this week? Well, yes. Um, you know, thinking about folks who lose their homes because the state is recouping what it's spent uh, on their health care makes me think of the, what I fear is a coming wave of foreclosures and evictions as individuals are unable to get current with their bills for, for housing, their mortgages, their rent payments, uh, and that's another wave that's going to hit us. I'm not sure we're prepared for it. Let's come on back in a couple of weeks or next week, and we'll talk about it some more. Okay. I want to thank you both. Thank you. For the Somerville Media Center Live with State Representative Christine Barber and State Representative Denise Provo. As always, stay safe, stay informed. We'll see you next time.